everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hello, Rob. It's Diana. And it's me, Jackie, 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 Jackie. That's good. That's a good opening. Thanks. I've been working on it. You've been, you've been workshopping that through the holiday season, you know? The, uh-huh. And I'm going to do a, my own spinoff on Saturday morning cartoon, <laughs> and I'll just be a Muppet. Just dancing around. Mm-hmm. I think it suits you. Me too. And I'll be like, Jackie, 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 Jackie. What's the theme song? Or that you just do that on the show? That's the only thing that's on the show. Oh, okay. It's a short that's, show. That's it's it? a very short show. Snackable internet content? 30 seconds. Okay. Sounds good. Well, this isn't a podcast about <laughs> Jackie's hopes and dreams for a fake puppet show. <laughs> this is a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research. Wow, we really... Took a hard sharp, left sharp with turn. content there. <laughs> sorry, everyone. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Every week, we pick a topic in the field of behavior analysis and discuss it at length, specifically discussing research related to said topic. Specifically, 70 minutes of length. <laughs> 70 minutes of length. Specifically, more specifically. And this week, we are going to be talking about behavior analytic language for all. Because we're a very inclusive podcast, we want everyone to understand about behavior analysis. And sadly, when you look at the research about behavior analytic language, it's not that great. Because most Some would people, say dismal. It's dismal. Most people don't Abidismal. like Because that's what it looks like. Abysmal. Most people don't want to hear about behavior analytic language, which is why I'm always surprised people want to listen to our podcast. Because that's all we talk about. So why not talk about the topic of why that might be and how can we fix it. If you've been listening to the show for a while or would like to go back into the archives, we did a whole episode called How to Speak to Non-Behavior Analysts, which kind of... It's episode 26. Yes, thanks, Diana. It, it tangentially covered some of the material in tonight's episode, though it was more just on kind of general demeanor in speaking to others. This episode is going to get into the nitty gritty of the words we use, our verbal behavior in relation to discussing behavior analysis with others. Now, we all have fun doing that. We love it. Like we said, we do a whole podcast devoted to talking about behavior analysis. But unfortunately, most people who don't know about behavior analysis don't want to hear about our behavior analytic language. So let's start talking about why that is. Let's do it anyway. Let's do it anyway. Well, if you're listening to this show, you might be one of the experts who research shows does like hearing about precise behavior analytic terminology. If you're a brand new student, perhaps you won't enjoy it quite as much. No, but we're going to put it all in context. It's all going to make sense at the end. It's all going to make sense at the end. What articles are we reading? We are reading four different articles, but we read them already. We're talking about them now. Oh, my gosh. God, this podcast would be the boringest thing ever if all we did was read other people's (laughs) articles, like like an audio book. Oh, my God. I would love that, actually. Turn the page now. Ding! You could choose your own adventure. How would you do that with an article that's pre-written? With a podcast. You pick three articles. Okay. And then you have them each by chapters. Right? And so no. I was like, if you want to hear the methods section, go to chapter three. <laughs> if you want to go skip to the results, go to chapter four. Like most graduate students, do you want to read the abstract and then skip to the first paragraph of the discussion and then kind of call then, it a day? And then read the last paragraph before references? You're done. <laughs> yeah, I don't really see a problem there. No. No one will I do know. abstract, read the graph to figure out the results and the methods at the same time. Right. And if I can't, then I go back to the methods and mm-hmm. then I read the discussion. Mm-hmm. Me too. I only want to read the abstract if I'm not 100% sure what the article is going to be about. And I just need to determine, is this something that I have time to read now because it is directly valuable to my needs as someone looking at research at the moment? Other than that, like if I'm told here, you have to read this article or please read this article about blank. I don't even, I, don't know, I just skip the abstract. Just- uh, sometimes the purpose is all you need. Yeah, kind of just, it's not enough. It's like just not enough information. All right, well, let's start with the titles. The first article we'll be discussing is From Technical Jargon to Plain English for Application by Lindsley. And that was in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis way back in the halcyon days of 1991. And then we skip a whole bunch of years into the present and we'll be reading three more recent articles on the social acceptability of behavior analytic terms. Crowdsourced Comparisons of Lay and Technical Language by Bessarevic, Critchfield, and Reed. And that's in The Behavior Analyst 2016. Then, Normative Emotional Responses to Behavior Analysis Jargon or How Not to Use Words to Win Friends and Influence People by Critchfield, Depke, Epting, Bessarevic, Reed, Feinup, Kremswriter, and Eckert from Behavior Analysis in Practice 2017. Nice job. 
And then because I, I don't think we've ever had this. It's like a hat trick of uh, journal articles. We got four articles, four different journals. Nice. We've got vernacular selection. What to say and when to say it by Newman from the analysis of verbal behavior. Twenty eighteen. Four very, very whatever different comes articles. after a hat trick. I don't even know. I don't know. Turkey. You start over. Trick. That's different. That's a, then you're talking golf. Or is that? No, that's, that's uh, bowling. bowling. That's bowling. Three strikes in a row is a turkey. Oh. I need to get one strike first, and then I'll work on the turkey. So let's get started by going back to 1991. And Ogden Lindsley has written this <laughs> nice paper talking about the phenomenon of behavior analytic jargon and wondering, is that all there is? Is this the only language we're going to ever use? And if so, what possible consequences might that have? Let's go back in time, Joe. Here we go. But in case you were wondering, four strikes in a row in bowling is called a bagger. What? <laughs> Did you know that? A I looked it up on the internet. Uh, <laughs> but a bagger. A bagger. Bagger. But I am going to start us off by talking about Lindsley's article published in 1991 called Technical Jargon to Plain English. And I think the most interesting part of this article is right in the beginning. It draws you in. It's really, really interesting to read the first few paragraphs to find out where behavior therapy came from. Mm -hmm. So what he suggests is that behavior therapy came from them trying to find the least offensive, most relatable terms to study behavior. So he said that originally they were going to call his laboratory the Experimental Analysis of Behavior Laboratory. That didn't really sound good. It sounded a little menacing. And so what they did is they wanted to figure out how they could label their laboratory without making it sound weird and creepy. Mm -hmm. But right? also but also relic reflecting what reflect was going to go on right. there. Yeah. So what they did is they picked the puppy dog candy factory. <laughs> that sounds horrible. Yeah, it does actually. Mm. <laughs> so what they did is they wrote a list of words, common layman term words mm -hmm. that would reflect what they were doing, right? Synonyms. And they ranked these words from most offensive to least offensive, which I find fun. And then what they came out was Behavior Research Laboratory was the second one, but the first one was Behavior Therapy Laboratory. So those did not seem menacing or, you know, the least amount of menacing to people. They kind of reflected on what they were doing studying behavior, right? Looking at therapy within their laboratory. Once they got established, they wrote to Skinner and his colleague and said, hey, we'd like to be called the Behavior Research Laboratory. And, and Skinner said, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And it doesn't sound like you're making people angry or making, like, it doesn't sound creepy and menacing. Mm -hmm. But it's exactly what you're doing, right? You're researching behavior. Right. And that's what they said. They said someone called them and said, oh, you research behavior? And they said, exactly. <laughs> they said, that is how we know. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's how we know we've labeled our laboratory correctly mm. because someone from the lay community knows what we're doing, mm -hmm. yeah. which I like. Yeah. I like that. Way better than human operant laboratory. Yes. Which is another of, of their potentials. Right. Yeah, that sounds yeah. like some sort of like weird government think tank. Like, what do you do that? Ooh, wouldn't you like to know? I'm not operant. going to tell you, though. Mm -hmm. It's too dangerous. Yeah. It's like in Stranger Things at the Hawkins. Yeah. Facility, oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> like you're driving down and like there's a... Other dimensions yeah. they exploring. So, you don't want that. And so then he talks about... So once they figured out their laboratory name... Their purpose was to take the technical jargon that our community has and to make it easy for the listener to understand it. So Skinner said that we should select words based on the effect on the listener and not necessarily on the speaker. And so this is what Skinner told us, but he didn't necessarily always do that, right? Mm -hmm. So experimental analysis of behavior doesn't really roll off the layman's tongue, mm -hmm. right? And when we talk about negative reinforcement and punishment, how we discuss those as behavior analysts are very different from what the normal verbal community, mm -hmm. uh, the non-behavior analytic community would discuss, right? Mm -hmm. So we have frequently have to have that discussion like, oh, punishment. I'm not talking about like spanking and yelling, right? So my definition of punishment is different than your definition of punishment. Mm -hmm. And so Lindsley wants to talk about how we can get to describing behavior analysis in layman's terms so that people come to accept our 
profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think one of the important points that we've mentioned a few times, but I don't think we've gone into too much depth is, is the idea that there's, you know, you've got your speaker and your listener. These are the relationships involved in all verbal behavior. And depending on who our listeners are, we have multiple audiences that we would be speaking to. Right. And depending on our audience, that will shape the language that we use or the verbal behavior that we engage in with each audience. Right. So if you think about this in layman's terms, <laughs> I may speak differently when I'm at the mall with my girlfriends, my GFs, mm -hmm. than I would with my grandma, mm -hmm. right? Because the verbal- GM. My GM. Right. <laughs> like the verbal community that I'm in at that present moment, but be it my grandmother or my GFs, my girls, my besties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You swear all the time with your grandmother, whereas you wouldn't do that with your friends, right? right? Absolutely. Be offended. Yeah. yeah. Your grandma doesn't care. She's- she she's old, she's old, old school that way. She's like high five and she's like, you better say the F word, <laughs> Jackie. But right. So that's like a layman's definition when you look about an example on how, depending on who we're with, our language is shaped by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if you think, sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, okay. but, but then just again, if we're thinking about it in terms of, you know, back to those, those layman's terms, think about a time that you have started speaking in a way, you know, with an audience, you don't typically speak that way. It may have gone well. People might have said, you know, wow, you're so well spoken. You know, usually you don't speak so fluently on a subject, you know, a precise scientific subject. How exciting. But more often than not, if you are engaging with your listeners of one type of audience with <coughs> completely different repertoire of verbal behavior, the response you get is usually pretty negative or blank stare. <laughs> you get I've the blank the, stare. I hate that. Dead eyes. What the hell are you oh. talking about? Yeah, it's it's. I have to it's go to very, the bathroom. You become very averse. You know, your, your behavior becomes very aversive to others very quickly. I know that one time I went off on a tangent at a cocktail party about behavior analysis and something, and I got some dead eyes, and I went through them. I pushed through those cues, and then I got the, oh, I'm sorry, I have to go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. But really, I watched the person, and then they just went to go get a drink, and then went somewhere else. There was no bathroom going. But yeah, so you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be that aversive yeah. person. You're, you're talking to someone, and they keep looking at their watch, and they're like... <laughs> I think my phone just rang. <laughs> Hold on. Oh my gosh, and it's emergency. I've got to go over here now. Right. So, which is, you know, in, in a party is sort of like a funny anecdote. But think right. about if your job is to convince people that you are a scientist who is able to affect meaningful change for clients. If the response of the person you're trying to convince us of is, ooh, look at the time right. and walking away, right. you are no longer delivering behavior analytic services because nobody wants to be your, well, not your friend, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to. Nobody wants to be near you. you. Yeah, right? nobody wants to work with you. So yeah, so this first paper that we're going to talk about looks at how Lindsley translated technical jargon into plain language to use in the public education because he worked a lot in the public schools. And he said this may be helpful for those expanding the field of autism. So people that are working not with other behavior analysts and how we can, you know, move toward a a better collaboration with people outside of our field. Mm -hmm. No, one caveat he makes is that it is actually very important that we have that technical language because some argue that if you don't have technical language in your field, you're actually not progressing as a profession, mm -hmm. right? So think about doctors. Doctors have their own technical language that the doctor ease with each other, right? But then your doctor should then be able to translate his doctorese or her doctorese right to you when you go into the room. And it is one of the scariest things when they forget to do that, right? right. <laughs> I remember I had some ailment at one point and she, you know, my doctor was looking through a book and she like, oh, you have blah, 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 blah. And it was like a very long, scary sounding name. Yeah. And I was like, am I going to die? And she's like, you have a cold. And I was like, oh, <laughs> right. So, you know, other established professions have to have to do this as well. And as behavior analysts, we need to be able to use, know when to use our technical language and then when to trans that technical language into language that other people will be able to understand. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Lindsley discussed how, what the definition of plain English was. So his definition was one or two syllable words in active and present tense. And hopefully the word could be interchangeable as a noun, a verb, and an adjective because that's like words that people use in early childhood. So that was his rationale. And so he said that these are the words that he used when he was developing precision teaching, which we're not going to talk about today, but we're going to use how he talked about translating jargon into plain English and how we might do it. So he developed 10 steps on what we should do. The first thing is, is that once we found something interesting, label it and move on. So if it's something new, 
Give it a name. Don't worry about it. Don't lose sleep over the name right now. Just put it on top of that little file folder and file it away for later, knowing that the name is going to change. This is a literal file folder or mind file folder, Jackie? So I think it is either a computer file folder <laughs> now or a manila. Is that how you say it? <laughs> Yep. Yes. I usually say vanilla, but I've been working on it. Mmm, <laughs> yeah. these delicious vanilla folders. <laughs> well, they're like yellow, so it they makes sense. They are vanilla sense. colored. If you're looking yeah. to get your office mate are. something for Christmas or something, you vanilla know, fold- you should. I hope you bought them some vanilla folders. Vanilla you can't go wrong. scented folders. So get your vanilla scented manila folder, <laughs> write it out, file it away. If it's something that you didn't personally create, right, you found a name for it in mm-hmm. the published literature, don't change that name. Right. Use that name. Mm-hmm. Use the technical jargon and be okay with it, right? Because you didn't create it. You can't just find something like it and then change the name of it. Mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. Then number three, you may, if you've created it, select a working term that may be more user-friendly and work on it, like work in it. So change your name, change your label, that manila folder, vanilla scented manila folder is probably going to have a lot of white out on it. Maybe you should make it in pencil. So every time you are thinking about it and working with the procedures, you are trying to get closer and closer and closer to a layman's definition. So an application that's going to be very user friendly for everyone involved. Number four, Explain what your procedure is using your working definition and then listen to others talk about your idea and modify how you talk about it and write about it based on how they do it. I like that. Mm -hmm. Right? So if I'm telling you and teaching you something, I'm calling it this, like the coolest cool cat behavior plan. You're like, phenomenon. Phenomenon. And then you're like, well, that's not really what it's doing. You're like, but you're... That sounds like positive reinforcement right. to me, Jackie. That's not... I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, so then I would modify it based on how you are teaching others. I love this one. Number five, it's like, hey, resist investing time and money into your newly formed working plan. Let it simmer. That's my, like, mm-hmm. take on it. Don't rush into it mm-hmm. because if it's a newly formed idea, over time, it's bound to change and it should change. Mm-hmm. And don't waste money making marketing materials, making tons of workshop materials if you're going to change it and then you have to rechange all the paper. It's actually environmentally friendly and smart. I feel like these steps are almost like natural environment social validity checking. So you just leave it there. Just kind of let it sit. And if you say it, they will come kind of. Yeah. (laughs) You can talk about it. If nobody comes, you came up with a bad term. Yeah. Like you can talk about it, but don't try to, you know, don't Don't try to push it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And then he says... He says, keep a list of alternative words that you could use six to eight and keep hashing over those and upgrade if you feel necessary in that same file. So that manila folder, if you're a type A, is going to have a lot of those little like white papers where you get to change mm-hmm. the name. You're just going to have a lot of stickers. It's those okay. are the label stickers. The yeah. label stickers. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't remember what they were called. And then this is actually, I think, very important. It says, use a thesaurus. Figure out what synonyms are for that. Maybe one of them will be more perfect than your working definition, but also go to the dictionary and find out the alternate meanings of the word. Mm. He pointed out a really good example of radical behaviorism, how one was just like departing from what's common was one definition, and the other one was like radically being like something the exact opposite Mm. of what was happening. And he said, Skinner meant the first one and not the second one, but everyone else thinks it's the right. second one. Right, I always one. thought it was the second one Yeah, as well. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was the coolest, most tubular behaviorism that was out there. <laughs> That's why everyone likes talking about it so much. <laughs> but, totally tubular. Totally tubular. But then what does tubular mean? What are the synonyms of tubular? Radical. <laughs> it, it, it's the audience of people who would have used that term have all gotten yeah. super old, so they wouldn't say it anymore. Right, so then he he goes on to talk about, okay, what is Skinner actually meaning? What are my alternative words? He thought maybe environmental. Bodacious. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, tubular and bodacious. Yep. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles all the way. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. He thought maybe environmentalism behaviorism because you're looking to the environment. Mm -hmm. He's like, obviously, that didn't stick. Yeah. That's like something that you could have done, right? Mm -hmm. It would mean something very different. I think today, if you talked about how, like, I study environmental behaviors, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, like recycling and stuff. Right. It, it really would. It would be difficult. Yeah. But back in the 90s, they didn't do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Recycling was just, was a new fad. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't quite as common. Right. And then once you agree on a word with your fellow colleagues, keep testing it with applications and practitioners. But again, he was like, do not publish quickly. He's like, be patient. 
be thoughtful until something feels more. You'll he's like you when it happens you'll know, mm-hmm. and everyone around you will know. That needs to be a little more concrete for me because I'm never gonna publish ever. Right? I'm like I'm not sure. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so that's what he said. So make sure that. You're thinking about it, talking to people, testing it out, revising it before you're just going ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all if you're coming up with a brand new term. Yeah. Right? Which not that many people do. No. Or he also said you could do that if you are trying to explain a term, like a technical jargon term mm-hmm. to someone. Like you could call it something, but you still need to test that out. So mm-hmm. everybody sure. still knows what you're talking about. And I think it's part of the article did get more and more into that component of, without saying marketing, really the idea of right. marketing, mm-hmm. which are more recent articles that we'll be discussing, get right to the, to the nitty gritty of it. It's a lot of what we're doing is marketing to an extent, you know, yeah. getting people to be mm-hmm. interested in the topic that we are quote unquote selling. And like, so at the end, his end kind of paragraph I felt was actually really applicable for behavior analysis in a whole. It was like, be okay to change things when you realize they're not working. Mm -hmm. I like that, right? If you have a name of something and nobody likes it, nobody likes your acronym, nobody likes your analogy, Mm -hmm. right? Nobody likes how you have assigned it. It's okay to change it, right? It's okay to make sure that everyone's on board with what you're saying and that's not like the end of you. Be okay with moving forward and revising that. Yeah. I love that. So he kind of gives us just a foundation of how we can take our technical language and talk to other people about behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. So Lindsley had these great steps, all the practitioners from 1991 on, you know, used them all the time. And that's why everyone uses great behavior analytic terms all the time nowadays, right? Correct. That's the end of the episode then, folks. (laughs) Just keep using the terms. No, unfortunately, many of these principles have not really been borne out in practice or even as our, our three recent articles mention, even in the research, this sort of hasn't been a lot of work done to think about how our behavior analytic terminology is reflected upon by the members of our community who aren't other behavior analysts. And I think if you've been to a conference in the past few years, there's been somebody talking about the concern that I think we all have of, is behavior analysis a science that has all the great answers that nobody cares about? Or is it a science Correct. that I see? I see a lot. I think uh, Jeannie Donaldson at, at Babbitt this year mentioned it. You know, not not quite this way, but I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit. The idea of there's so many people out there who's talking about changing behavior and behavior change and the analysis of behavior, and they're not BCBAs. They're psychologists who have taken some of the same ideas and rebranded, and they've just done it in a way that everyone got it. Oh, I understand that now. Mm-hmm. Oh, that makes sense to me now. And it markets and people like the idea. And you have a lot of folks who seem unable to describe the actual principles of behavior behind some of the techniques being recommended, but they got a snappy title. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about in these next three articles is why is that? Is this an accurate assessment or are we sort of just being hard on ourselves? Spoiler alert. No, no, we're not just being hard on ourselves. And what could we do to change it? So, Diana, why don't you tell us a little bit about Newman's thoughts on the vernacular. Killer we should language. have titled this this topic. Know what I mean, Vern? <laughs> vernacular selection. Oh. Wow. <laughs> That's actually all I had to say. No, <laughs> no I'm just kidding. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Ernest. <laughs> I can't remember. What, what percentage Ernest of the audience actually knows Ernest anymore? Ernest and Vern. I know. Like Ernest goes to camp. Oh. Yeah, I know. Ernest scared stupid. Mm-hmm. Ernest goes to jail. He does go yep. to jail. Ernest saves Christmas. He does save Christmas. Okay. All right. So. This article is really pretty recent. It came out in 2018 in TAVB, and it was the work of one man, Paul Newman. He also has a... No, just kidding. (laughs) It's spelled Mm N-E-U-M-A-N, so it's not the Paul Newman that you may be thinking of. It is a different Paul Newman who has a really great handle, I think, on this topic, and Mm -hmm. I loved this article. She really did. I she, thought your New Year's resolution was not to love every article that you talk about. But she actually now. loves this one. <laughs> but I do love this article. Okay. So we'll have to start that next episode. Okay. I really thought this article was great. Mm-hmm. And I already love this topic anyway. So it was just it's exciting. It was an exciting find. And I'm so glad that we're getting to talk about it now. And I hope that mm-hmm. I do it justice because it is a little bit of a lot to 
to chew. It's definitely one that I think if you were a newer practitioner to behavior analysis or talking with precision and using technical language about verbal behavior would probably be a lot. I think of, you know, like a really recent uh, people who passed their exam, but is worth learning about. So come back, you know, if, if you read it and it's not quite clicking when you come back to it a little later when you have a little more experience talking about verbal behavior, because there's very much in there. Very much. And it's very well presented in a way that is yeah, it really is understandable. It, it gets at the heart of what radical behaviorism is, right? And that is what I'm going to discuss with you guys. But it can take a little bit of time, I think, spending time with the behavior analytic literature and going and back and reading some of the, the old big writings to get a good grasp on what radical behaviorism really is. Because, you know, quote unquote, doing ABA versus being a radical behaviorist, sometimes those two things operate can operate independently. And I mm -hmm. think I want everyone to be a radical behaviorist who's doing ABA. Mm -hmm. So this article could help you get there. So the way that they, way that Newman starts this conversation out is by saying, how should we really present our behavior analytic concepts and principles to the community at large? Because as we've all established here, behavior analysis does have a PR problem. Rob's going to talk to us more about just how much people don't like the traditional technical terms that we use in behavior. Nobody likes us. Analysis. And we have to figure out what are we going to do about that, right? So there's sort of two camps that have differing opinions on what exactly we should do. So one says that we should really just stick to our technical, precise language that we and our you know forefathers in behavior analysis have developed because this language allows us to talk so precisely about the science of behavior, and we need to be precise because it is a science. So do we just stick with that, continue to use those terms because of the level of precision that they allow us, even knowing that that could be off-putting and or create misunderstanding in the general community? Which it does. Which it does, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or... Point one. <laughs> right. So Phil Heinlein has written some articles on that that I'm sure present a much more broadly and sure. nuanced picture than what I just described. And then on the other side, there's the Lindsley article that we just read and then Pat Fryman has written on this too that says, no, really we should use more simple language to introduce our concepts and avoid confusion and then perhaps build from there. Which we could do, but we may lose something there as well. Right. So what Newman is going to argue in this paper is, really we can reconcile these two camps and respect the technical language that the basis of our science, while also finding a way to bring that over to the lay community without losing the precision with which we're actually discussing behavior analytic principles. I love that. Right? But just reanalyzing the actual language that we're using to describe those principles. Which might make it more precise, to be honest. Right? If we're reanalyzing yeah. what we're talking about then we're sure that what we're talking about is what we really want to be talking about. <laughs> yes, very precisely. Cir precisely. <laughs> very circular. It's like an Ouroboros of a Hello. definition right there. Hello, <laughs> very circular. All right. So uh, he's arguing that everyone can benefit from this precise language, which is distinct from technical language, right? So technical language are all the terms that we learn in school, right? Like differential reinforcement and extinction and punishment, right? I don't know. <laughs> There's probably some more. Three technical... Technical terms. <laughs> so that, that's our technical language, but we're going to talk more about what it means to have precise language. Precise language is really based not on the speaker, but on the listener, right? And that everyone within that speaker's community is going to discriminate th those words in the same way and take away the same meaning from that particular definition. So it doesn't have to be something that's technical, but it needs to be a word that we use precisely within our verbal community. So... Our precise language is really maintained by the listener effects, like I said, and those have a discriminative function on our verbal behavior as it relates to both verbal and nonverbal behavior by familiar speakers within that verbal community. So he kind of presents like both sides of the argument. So first of all, he says, why should we have a language of behavior analysis? Now, we are all behavior analysts here. So I am. Easy for us to say, well, of course we should have language of behavior analysis. And no one's arguing against that, right? Like I sort of stated before, it's behavioral science, right? So it's a scientific language that we're using to describe the principles of behavior analysis and how environmental effects 
change behavior. Like that's what we're doing here, right? We're talking about prediction and control of behavior. So we need a technical language in order to discuss the nitty gritty of those types of things. Additionally, our technical language allows us to continue to condense and boil down any other things that are getting thrown into the behavior analytic pool into those conceptually systematic principles that we all know and love, right? And it doesn't, it prevents our science from getting watered down and with just confusion of varying types of terminologies. And I really, really love that about behavior analysis. So it's important that we have this specialized language as part of our science. Students of behavior analysis should most certainly learn from this technical language. While we're learning all these behavioral and analytic terms in our technical language as students, the other thing that we're learning that's really very important is related to the causal status of behavior. What actually causes behavior? And as a behavior analyst, we attribute causes of behavior to external events. Those can be history of reinforcement. They could be current environmental events that are present. It could be related to the evolutionary history of the organism, etc. Right. And this is a really important distinction to make because this differs quite greatly from how the lay community and honestly, how all of us were raised, right? Right. Mm-hmm. It, within our, the larger societal verbal community, think about the causation of behavior. So the traditional understanding of what causes behavior is one of what's called contiguous causation. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Meaning that there is a behavior that happens and then there is something that preceded that behavior. And I was always taught a billiard ball analogy. So there's a, some type of event happening and it must touch the behavior temporally in time. So it's like a cue ball smacking into a, another billiard ball and sending that billiard ball on its way, requiring those two things to be connected through time. This is how, again, we've kind of all thought about behavior while we're raised. And if you aren't a student of behavior analysis, this is probably how you think about behavior too. And it's how our language, in fact, is even structured for us to, to attribute causality. To behavior. And what this means is that if behavior needs to be connected in time to some type of prior setting event, then we have to account for what may have happened inside the body right before the behavior occurred. And if we're saying that the thing that happened right before behavior occurred is the thing that caused the behavior, and if the thing that happened right before behavior occurred was something that was inside the body that we cannot see, then suddenly we have created a situation where we are applying agency to something inside the body that we cannot see. And that's very, very different from how we think about behavior as radical behaviorist, which is that behavior is a product of its history of reinforcement, past contingencies, as well as motivating operations and setting events play into it as well. So saying that there's things that are going on inside the body that we can't see, but they must be the things that cause behavior, that's more the realm of pop psychology, attributional psychology, and methodological behaviorism as well, which preceded radical behaviorism. Mm. Right? You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So that ends up creating these, what's called mediating constructs. Yes. Inside the brain. And in doing so, you sort of lose all way of knowing about what's really going on. True. Right? Yep. You guys on board with this idea? 100%. Mm. Okay, cool. We're on board with it in the sense that that's not how we think. 100%. Great. Just trying to make sure. Actually, I love that. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So sort of just because things are happening in close temporal proximity, you're putting together like a little story about this must be how it happened. It's like, why is the yep. sun gone? Mm-hmm. Probably a giant wolf ate it. That's what I think happened. Can you prove otherwise? Not exactly, I guess. But that's what we all now believe. A wizard did it. Could be one other way to describe it. Could be. If a wizard was close to you at the time that your behavior changed, it could have been a wizard. You're right. There's no way to know. <laughs> it could have been the homunculus inside your brain. It could have been. Yeah. You so went in your mind files. The other, everything around. The other thing that happens inside the body are things like thinking and knowing, right? And feeling. And those are real things. And we as radical behaviorists 
don't disagree. Those are 100% real things, but they're just behavior that's happening inside the skin, right? So they do not take on what Newman calls special causal status as well. They in and of themselves are just additional behavior that is also a product of its previous reinforcement history too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, as though one of his examples is I like ice cream and that's why I went and got some, (laughs) right? Because of the liking in my brain. The liking. The liking was the reason, right? And it's more complicated than that. Like you do like ice cream, Mm -hmm. right? Who doesn't? But that's not why you went to get the ice cream, mm-hmm. right? Right. The the reason you got ice cream is because in the past, when you went through this series of steps, it produced ice cream, and then you got the chance to eat that ice cream, and eating that ice cream was reinforcing. Yes. So then the next time it's been a long time since you've had ice cream, you're going to go through those steps again in order to get more ice cream. Yeah. Really wish I had some ice cream. I know. Now. I love ice cream. And while if you're just sort of chatting with your friends about you know something you're interested in doing later today, you can kind of be a little sloppy with your how you know how much of a stringent radical behaviorist you are in describing sure, everything going on. Of course. If you're trying to get to the bottom of a problem behavior that has some sort of a link to ice cream, if you just focus on like, well it's the liking of ice cream, it's like, well there's no way to solve this problem. I, I can't get into the liking gland. I don't know where it is. <laughs> exactly. I know where it is. It's a lot of circular logic, do you? Yes. <laughs> Teleological is the word. Love that word. When you're talking about circular reasoning. The study of the color teal. Yes, I know it well. <laughs> so the beautiful thing about behavior analysis is that it does not rely on these mediational constructs to explain causation. And causation can now be extended over time. So it's related to the consequences of behavior, not the immediately preceding event. Which makes it really helpful, right? Because then it can deal with things from our far past mm-hmm. where we say, oh, I don't like this one thing because when I was two, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Some very traumatic thing happened to me, and now I'm like, I find this one stimulus is correlated with that adverse mm-hmm. event. Now I'm avoiding it, but I don't know why, right? Mm-hmm. It's because of something that happened far long ago, but they're still connected. Yeah. Yeah, but and also. It, and it doesn't place special status no. on yeah. something inside the brain, no. right? So it's yeah. not like, oh, you now you have this phobia, and the phobia is the reason why. So yeah. it allows us to, you know, really understand behavior within this larger conceptual framework. Yeah. And then it's the same idea of if now you're like, aha, I've engaged in verbal behavior describing my phobia. That's not going to actually change your response when presented with the stimulus that leads to, you know, your phobic behavior. Yeah. So while students are learning this technical language of behavior analysis, they're also introduced to this idea of non-contiguous causation. And Honestly, like that idea is the root of radical behaviorism. It's so different than how we normally think. And the next section that Newman talks about gets at why that might be problematic. So next he discusses why perhaps should we not have a technical language of behavior analysis. And one of the main reasons is the one that you guys have also talked about is, as he says in quotes, it produces problematic listener effects. <laughs> in other words, no one really likes behavior analytic language. We like it because we've been sort of put through like trial by fire with it, right? Like learning to speak as a behavior analyst is a really complex repertoire mm-hmm. to establish, it's one that's heavily reinforced within our very small community and one that took a great deal of time and effort to acquire. So I think we, we're very proud of our language. We love being able to speak it with one another, but that doesn't mean that everyone else appreciates it to the same degree. He points out a couple of cool examples, like when Aubrey Daniel changed discussing changing behavior in the workplace and instead called it performance Mm -hmm. rather than behavior. He saw a big increase in consulting jobs for him just by making one change to the word in the same way that apply behavior analysis came to replace behavior modification Mm -hmm. back in the day. Right. So verbal community is always changing. Language is always changing. And the words that we use to describe things will change in response to changes in that community as well. So one might wonder, well, is it just that technical language is not cool? People don't like it. He says no, because in neuroscience, they did some studies that found that the language that was in fact more technical and had more technical terms in it and was a longer description was preferred over less technical terms. But Rob's going to go into the differences between what they found with that and then what they found with behavior analysis. Yeah. So before we do that, 
Let's take a little break from our conversation and then we'll come back to finish up with does the research play out all of our worst fears about our language? We'll be right back. Do you want to be a VCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we're back talking about technical behavior analytic language and whether anybody likes it. We do, but maybe other people don't. Let's talk more about it, shall we? But before we do that, I want to make sure that everyone listening knows the fun news. ABA Inside Track is ACE approved. By listening to our show, you are able to earn one learning credit. Yes. Yes. New name for what was the type two CEs. New year, new you. New year, new you. Learning credits. Yes. So all you need to do is listen to the whole episode and then go to the website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen CEUs. And you can order those, but you're going to need to know two secret code words. Let me tell you the first one. It is mustard, M-U-S-T-A-R-D, mustard. You know, the delicious condiment you might put on, say, like a hot dog or Or a burger or a pretzel. Yum. Mustard. All right. So we've been talking about vernacular language. We've been talking about concerns related to do our listeners enjoy hearing about behavior analytic language. And before we took the break, Diana, you mentioned Newman's review of some research that people love hearing about neuroscience language. So it's not a matter of people don't like science. They language. love it. Or I don't remember if he specified whether it was Americans in the study or, but the, the respondents, at least in that study, love hearing definitions, no matter how long they are, if the brain or neuroscience is somehow mentioned. I wonder if they feel the same way about behavior analysis. So we're first going to talk about Besarevic and colleagues study, and then we'll talk about uh, the Critchfield study. They're, they're both very similar in terms of what they're looking to do. So I, I might start putting, you know, putting some of the pieces That's of their fine. articles together. So like we've been talking about, we have a, a marketing problem in behavior analysis. And certainly these two articles looked to research. Is that something we're just worried about? We just sort of the social validity seems low or is there an actual dislike of the terminology we use and if so whose fault is it and the authors would say it's it's kind of our fault because we are very proud of our language we're very proud of how we've developed as a science and like we said some of becoming a science means using jargon but have we gone a little too far in the jargon category because we need to be able to effectively communicate what it is we do if we have jargon that actually sends a message like we're talking about the radical behaviorism that term doesn't mean the same to everybody. And if that's something where, you know, that's the hill we're going to die on, where that's the language we're using, we may find ourselves losing clients or losing losing our audience, pretty much. There was uh, an anecdote that Besarevic mentioned in terms of someone writing an article, and they're talking about finding behavior analytic services. And the BCBA they were speaking to talked in terms that sounded very harsh and unnatural. But then they went to a different alternate therapy doctor and the language was much more caring. And, oh. they, you know, the doctor came and hugged them and was saying all these nice things. And, it, you know, it doesn't get into which professional the author of that article went to. But there certainly was a sense that probably going to pick the really nice doctor first. I know a lot of us in the field kind of feel like uh, if any of you remember the show King of the Hill. 
that was on with Hank Hill yeah. in Texas. And there's this great episode where he's a propane. He sells propane and propane accessories. Propane. And there's this hot salesman who's, who's just learning how to sell propane. And he's upselling everybody and he's going in. And Hank, just someone comes in and he's like, well, you know, propane is an excellent clean burning fuel. And he just hands him a pamphlet. And then that's it. That's it. That's his sale. And I think some of us kind of feel that way. Like, well, I'm a behavior analyst. Yeah, behavior analysis. Kind of expect everyone's going to throng to us just because, you know, our science is so great and we know it. At the end of that episode, someone comes back. He's like, I need to buy all the grills because this pamphlet really sold me on it. But most of the time, if all you do is be like, yeah, behavior analysis, it's amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, sir. I'm going to go anywhere else. You know, it doesn't quite work. And being warm and fuzzy while not a prerequisite for science is a bit of a prerequisite for clients to some extent. So at least in Desarevic's article, the purpose was to quantify the general public's reactions to technical versus non-technical terms that refer to behavior analytic principles. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on uh, the procedure because it's almost it's very similar to what Critchfield and colleagues do in their study. They used a platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk or MTurk which I had never heard of till I read these articles. Me neither. And I was a typo when I read it. (laughs) I was like, mechanical Turk, what? And it sounds like something that was created like at the turn of the 20th century, some sort of automaton maybe that you know cracked nuts or whatever it did. But in this case, it's a crowdsourcing a survey platform. So you have these online workers that sample a number of different individuals across the United States, and they'll complete little tasks for money. So the participants in this study are members of this sort of platform that had completed 100 different human intelligence tasks, what they were called, but pretty much they were just surveys and gotten feedback from previous surveyors that designated 95% or more of their work as acceptable quality. So while these are people who are answering surveys for money, they have done this enough times as to be somewhat uh, considered reliable by other people. You get a survey, you get 30 cents if you finish it in 20 minutes. And the survey was pretty much just giving different terms. It was a pretty wide swath of uh, respondents. I'm not going to go into all the details of them, but it was not just, you know, undergraduate students. It was a lot of different people, a lot of different ethnic backgrounds, a lot of different regional backgrounds, and a lot of different educational backgrounds. And we had 200 participants. So this survey would present six pairs of terms. There was a technical behavior analytic term that was paired with a non-technical substitute. The terms were escape extinction, with this non-technical term being follow-through training, negative reinforcement, relieving consequences, negative punishment, penalty, chaining, teaching a sequence of responses, operant conditioning, learning from consequences, and reinforcement, incentivizing. So again, each term was our technical term and then the non-technical substitute. They all really came from a lot of the work that Lindsley had done, sort of just, you know, with some modern tweaks. And for each term presented, there was a question. How acceptable does the recommended treatment sound for each population of treatment client? So they present lots of different client groups and ask, what do you think about this term for this group? And they had 10 analog scales that you, you as the respondent would sort of move the slider on about whether or not it was very acceptable to, you know, not very acceptable. And the different categories of clients that they kind of, you know, pretended to be talking about included infants and toddlers, children with special needs, elementary age students, high school students, adults with special needs, senior citizens, again, the major groups of clients that one might work with. And so on one side of your line is completely unacceptable, and then the other completely acceptable. And for each client and each term, you sort of move the slider. And then they get a nice kind of aggregate of results. I kind of like how they did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's nice to think about. Mm -hmm. So the authors looked at the mean participant ratings for each of the terms for each of the 10 client populations. They took all that data and they found that pretty much every single substitute term was rated as more acceptable for doesn't matter what client population you're working with. Every single one, except for reinforcement versus incentivizing or incentivization was considered to be more acceptable, which means every single behavior analytic term that wasn't reinforcement for every single possible population we could work with, the respondents would prefer a different <laughs> a different way to phrase it. Yeah. That's pretty awful. That mm-hmm. means that almost every term we use is considered less acceptable than almost any other term you might be able to use. Yes. I mean, I'm generalizing a, a bit broadly there, but in terms of these terms that were presented. That's yeah. what it looks like. And it, it looked like they liked incentivizing okay when it was more like a workplace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, cause. Yeah, they, they rated nearly the same. I think like, college students might have been about the same. Yeah, mm-hmm. but like you don't like incentivizing babies that didn't go or, over well. Or, nope. chill, or young children. Yes, yeah, they didn't, no, they didn't no. like that. that so. 
Makes so sense. Terms yeah. like chaining and escape extinction were rated really low comparative to their to their kind of follow up term, which were teaching a sequence of responses and follow through training. The operant conditioning and negative reinforcement, not quite as different than the substitute terms, but still, again, we're, we're rated less acceptable. I still don't like, I don't like follow through training, though. Just saying. Well, we don't you should have, well, you should get on the always what extinction right. is. Right, that is not That's always true. what extinction is. That's why I don't love it. We'll get back into that when we talk Will more we? about it. Yes, I'm just yes, <laughs> when we talk about the Newman article some more. You know, again, so even when there was not that big a difference, it was almost as, Almost always like a 25 point difference in that acceptability mean negative punishment and penalty were a little bit closer. And again, reinforcing and incentivizing were really the only terms that you could say. Eh, nobody loved either of these terms. They were fine. So that means 41 out of 60 times when presented with these two terms, the behavior analytic term was considered much less acceptable. So, again, it's a survey. And our next study is a survey, too. So, you know, we have to tread carefully with our results. One of the problems we're going to run into with pretty much everything we talk about on this episode is it's not exactly clear why. Why is that that these terms are so are considered so unacceptable? They, although they did mention that someone went to the trouble of writing them an email, the authors an email. <laughs> they didn't get paid for this email. They just wrote an email saying some of the behavior approaches sounded cruel, even medieval. <laughs> Hmm. Well, if you think about where we came from and where we're at, we're a vastly different field from where we originally started from mm -hmm. until now, I think. And I think some, there might have been some negative things that happened in the beginning, right? If you look at the Lovell study, they did a brief slap on the thigh, right? In the 80s, nobody really wants that to happen now. And if you read mm -hmm. those old studies, they gave us a different impression of what behavior analysis is now, right? And we've moved I mean, there was a lot of good things happening, you know, in the past. I'm not going to say that there wasn't, but I think that the, the worldview of behavior analysis may have had a more of a negative connotation then, and it's still kind of with us. Mm -hmm. Right? Maybe. Yeah, but if you don't know anything about behavior analysis, you wouldn't necessarily equate these terms with oh, it. Oh, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. And the terms were not, I don't believe it was said as these are behavior analytic terms. These, they were just, just terms. terms. Okay. They were just terms people did not seem to like. Very much. You know, I won't go too much into the results because I think it goes into the Newman article, which we're going to come back to. Or, or not, sorry, not the results, but kind the of the, the closing points. Yeah. But the one that I think is pretty relevant is the idea that could reinforcement have scored about as well as incentivizing because reinforcement is the one term in our field, at least from these common behavior analytic terms, that has broad appeal so that people actually would use it has become lay language. Could be. I don't know. If it has, but, but there isn't another meaning of reinforcement, which is mm -hmm. like to shore up mm -hmm. something, right? Like I'm going to add some extra tape to this to reinforce it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the, it doesn't have the same connotation. <laughs> you know, keep my poster on the terms. wall. Yep. So, and that's a positive thing. Yep. Whereas all the other, I mean, extinction, obviously that's a terrible word. Yep. Dinosaurs, you know. Well, let's talk more about that. So Critchfield and colleagues sort of okay. continued the same on the same trend, they also used MTurk to look at the social acceptability of a lot of our science's terminology. So, like, Best Revick and colleagues sort of mentioned, well, we don't really know why some of these terms were considered less acceptable. So, what Critchfield and colleagues looked at was, well, let's take a look at just terms in general. Let's just speak about the English language and words that are used in the English language to look more precisely at the emotional reactions people have to certain types of words. So it's not going to necessarily get to the why of things, but sort of break down the idea of why certain terms might not be well received by a listener or by a you know, specific audience. As we all know, the more emotional reaction someone has to certain terms and words, you know, advertisers know this, are going to have a direct result on how well adopted the product or the activity is to others. Yeah, there's like whole companies to help you pick out your name of your product Yep, based on how people will receive it. Yeah. And the sense is that our terms are, why are they not acceptable? Are they actually so reviled <laughs> by, by the audience? You know, we kind of have the terrible feeling maybe, but let's look at it systematically. So Critchfield and colleagues looked at something called the Warner Corpus, which is a public domain list of 14,000 different English words rated for how they strike people emotionally. Those words were developed or that list was developed by people using that MTurk platform. And what survey respondents would do is rate emotional responses on three different dimensions. We're only really going to look at two. One was unhappy to happy on like a one to nine scale. The extent on which a given word elicits a general unpleasant emotions versus general pleasant emotions was kind of the definition that was given to the respondents. Mm -hmm. And then how arousing was the term in terms of calm being sort of you know low to excited. 
And this speaks more to the kind of the strength of behavioral activation. For the experiment, they changed the terms to not motivating to motivating. So that's the one I'm going to use in, in describing their research. So you have every word that's rated separately. So these are just how do I don't know? Like, what do you think of this word? And then you say a word. You know, threat. You know, it Bad. makes you happy, unhappy. It makes you motivated, not motivated. Yes. So it's not a context. So unlike the last study, it's sure. not a context. It's just, what do you think? What's your gut reaction to for threat? this word right here? No, I don't, I don't actually care what you guys oh, have to okay. say. I, I like, mean, I I'm do, but it. you know, not, not for the purposes of our podcast. Sure. So they looked <laughs> at the corpus for what words were recognized as important when we're discussing behavior analytic terms. They cross-checked those terms with Cooper, Heron, and Heward, and they found what words had an exact match. And those are the words that they're going to speak the most about. So they found four different categories of terminology. They were behavior analysis, technical terms, they had 39 terms. And these are terms that were very unique to us practitioners of behavior analysis, we practitioners of behavior analysis. They're related to the discussion of behavioral functional relations, interventions. They looked at 42 different general science terms, which could be used in behavior analysis, but they're not like specific to our field. They looked at specific behavioral assessment terms, so the terms that we use when we're, just, when we're measuring behavior, and then just general clinical terms, which again could be terms that are used in you know any sort of clinical setting. So they have a figure which shows all of the English language words. <laughs> this is like every word that's in this corner, all fourteen thousand you know points of light, and you have your x-axis, which is kind of looking <laughs> at the relative values of rating related to not motivating to motivating, and your y-axis is looking at your relative values of unpleasant to pleasant. So if you're looking at this graph, you know, the closer something is to you know, the origin, those are terms that are both considered not motivating and are unpleasant to hear. So what would be unpleasantly motivating? Well, I have some examples. Oh, Here good. are Thanks. some for you. Wonderful. No problem. So if you wanted a word that was pleasant, but not motivating, well, I'll give you some general examples. So auto, that's just right in the middle. It's are you not A-U-T-O? A-U-T-O, auto. It's not really pleasant, but it's also not unpleasant. It's not really motivating. It's not really unmotivating. It's right in the middle. Auto. It's kind of right in the middle. Okay. Yeah. You're it's right. unremarkable was the term I, yeah, that, I don't that feel the authors strongly. here use. Me neither. I'm just staring blankly. So. so you want a motivating term that's highly unpleasant. Insanity was one that came from this list. The that does not make me motivated. Well, you didn't fill out the survey. But it's excitable. It like is The original word was excitable. Yeah, it's yeah. excitable. Okay. Like you're going to you know, call to action. Sure, of. yeah. Uh-huh. Meadow would be a word that is very pleasant, but highly unmotivating. I agree. Calming. Yeah. yeah. Laying down. So it's like a good word. Like, oh, it makes me feel that. But you're not going to do anything. Sure. Thrill was very motivating. Yeah. And pleasant. I agree. So Remind thrill is a good word. Roller coasters. And then depressing is a word that is both unpleasant and unmotivating. Absolutely. It's like, ugh, I don't yeah. want to do anything. And I'm sad. Hmm. Yeah. Now. You know, depressing. That's like sock. Yeah. Sock. Or dirty to me, sock. I would say is mildly motivating because I want to like clean it up, but I find it unpleasant. <laughs> it's a very unpleasant no. word. What about? Let's. I want to do one. Flannel pajamas. <laughs> well, you have to do them separately. You have oh. to have flannel and then pajamas. Okay. How about flannel? That one I feel more neutral. Okay. Yeah, I, I, that, that's probably close to auto for me. Okay. Whereas pajamas, I would say, is a very pleasant word. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit motivating. <laughs> maybe a little bit motivating. So it's unmotivated. Bed, maybe. Right, but you do nothing in bed, so no, it's unmotivated. You do nothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, what were the results? So, those are some kind of just mile marker kind of words for y'all. So, the majority of general science terms and behavioral assessment terms and general clinic terms were rated as pleasant. The general science terms and, and behavioral assessment terms, about 67% of those terms were pleasant. 53% of the general clinical terms were rated pleasant. The majority of the behavior analysis terms unpleasant a good 60 percent of terms that are unique to behavior analysis were rated as unpleasant it's a bummer as based on the warner corpus so it wasn't like people are being asked to rate these terms like they were in the previous study it's just terms that had previously been rated using words that were already in this this warner corpus talk about a terrible name yeah <laughs> yeah i know seriously it's unpleasant and unmotivating so there's kind of a ratio for all of these from strongly positives to strongly negative. So general clinical terms had a pretty good ratio of like 12 to 9. You know, there are a lot of positive general clinical to, you know, mm -hmm. unpleasant ones. General science was 9 to 4. Behavioral assessment was 7 to 5. So again, majority was pleasant. For behavior analytic terms, the ratio of pleasant to unpleasant was 1 to 15. Good grief. Yeah. So people really don't like them. 28% of the behavior analytic terms were considered strongly motivating it was actually the only group that had a substantial percentage of words in that category. However, since you also consider them unpleasant and strongly motivating, my guess is you are motivated to like run away from those terms. Most of the other categories of terms were considered to not really be that motivating. 
So not only are these words considered unpleasant, but they'd also be considered really abrasive, you know, off-putting. In terms of looking at behavior analytic terms, I did want to have some specific examples. So positive was rated the most pleasant of all the terms. Contingency was related the least motivating. Operation, punish, and discrimination were also considered to be more motivating. Negative was considered the most unpleasant. Interesting. Conditioning and shape were just kind of in the middle. They're the auto of the, of behavior analytic terminology. You know, they have some other examples. You know, you can look at the figures, but, you know, what general science terms. So things like discovery was considered pleasant and motivating. Some general clinical terms. Uh, unethical is considered to be very unpleasant, whereas uh, disruptive would be considered most motivating. So, again, like in the previous study, there are some big limitations. These are a lot of self-reports. However, since what we're interested in these studies is, well, what, what are the emotional, right. potential emotional responses? We don't care that the self-reports is actually what, and we're, what, we're, what looking we're looking for. for. And again, the bigger one is you can only really test the words that are already in this this body of words. So it's not like we could test every single behavior analytic term. There might be some that people really like, but it's not semen. So so if you look at the overall percentage in English, according to the Warner Corpus of of terms that are, you know, what's the average sort of like, eh, you know, kind of blandly pleasant or you know, kind of terminology. So like what are kind of average words? The other categories all did much better. Behavior analysis was below average for blandly pleasant words. So words that people just kind of, you know, they're fine. Slightly above average for blandly unpleasant. Clinical terms also were. And we're very below average for rousingly pleasant. So nobody likes these words from this this population who who answered the questions. So very sad, very sad. And, you know, <laughs> so really what that tells us is if you are talking to people about behavior analysis and you're using behavior analytic terms, there is a good chance that the terms you are using at that gut level are making the people you talk to feel bad <laughs> and be motivated to change how horrible they feel. They actually referred to some of these verbal topographies that elicit unpleasant emotional responses as functionally abrasive repurposed terms oh ouch so these would be words like spank forbid skull you know words that people don't want to hear this does lead us to again that same point of okay well we know that we behavior analysts who have been doing have been in the field a long time have this great history with these words don't feel the same way right we don't but it seems like everybody else does and then the sad thing is even though we've been talking about the possibility that our terminology is not really preferred by the lay individual since at least 1991, if not definitely before then, we don't have enough research to really think about what might our considerations of, you know, I mean, certainly think about who your audience is. Are you talking to non-experts, in which case you need to be careful about how you're using your terminology. And, you know, we also don't know, even though we're talking about some emotional elicitation, it's not like that covers every piece of how listeners respond to speaker behavior. True. We don't know that just because these terms are considered unpleasant, doesn't mean that they're going to result in low rates of behavior change or follow through with intervention, though the research that exists does kind of point to the less liked terms are, the less people will follow through right. with recommendations. But if you're a condition reinforcer already, it may not matter. Yeah. And when does it stop? Ma- does right? it? How much does it matter? When would it stop mattering? You know, when's, when's, right. when's that, that flip? The, sh- the peak shift. The peak shift. That's the term. Thank you, Jackie. The peak shift there. And, you know, we haven't even done things like uh, there was a little bit of shade. I, I kind of got the sense of a little shade being thrown on, on Lindsley here of, you know, Lindsley loves these terms. And he says, from all his experience, they're great terms. But they hadn't ever been really studied. You know, just because we made up new terms, does that actually do, have we come up with good terms? You know, do we have terms that can sort of change that? Can we keep the precision of our science without maybe making people disgusted <laughs> by listening to us talk about it? So that's kind of what, let's come back to the Newman article, because I think he covers some of that in a little bit more detail than these other two articles. So Diana, do you mind picking up from there? Yep. I've just been on pause this whole time. <laughs> My goodness. I'm she, back. She literally even had her mouth open in a word talk, but it was just quiet. She heard me say extinction. It was like, blah, and she had to run out of the room. <laughs> she had some emotional responding. I know. Yeah. Right. So Rob's discussion just hit home the point that... Behavior analytic technical language is generally not preferred by individuals outside of our very, very small behavior analytic community. And Newman sort of highlights that, or he postulates, I guess, that the reason why behavior analytic jargon is not preferred is that it's really inconsistent with a vernacular understanding of the causes of behavior. Oh, yes. I agree with him. Yeah. The way that we attribute 
causes of behavior to be environmental factors rather than agency inside the individual is a really, really foreign idea mm. to pretty much everyone, right? Like we want to think of ourselves as self-made men and women, that the behavior that we engage in is behavior that we are choosing to engage in. The locus right? of control kind of idea. Exactly. Yeah. That it's something that we are in control of what we're doing, not that we're being bandied about by things that have happened to us prior. Mm. When in fact, that is how we think about behavior. Maybe not in those terms, but, but it's due to the history of consequences as well as the current setting events. Mm. That's just how it is. Mm. And this isn't something that's specific to humans, right? It's true across all organisms. And certainly human behavior is very complex, but it does boil down to these principles of behavior and the fact that you're likely going to respond according to those principles of behavior, even if you don't, quote unquote, know that that's what you're doing. That's really weird for people to think about. Mm -hmm. And not all of our technical language speaks to that, but it is sort of at the core of the way that we discuss behavior, if people give us enough time to talk about it. Mm. And he's reasoning that, that that in and of itself could be enough to put people off mm. from our language. So Newman then goes into attempting to describe how the speaker and the listener are going to interact and how our behavior may be modified based on the audience that's present, which totally makes sense, right? Like all other fields, like you said, Jackie, like a doctor doesn't come in and like spew out all of the things that they know in like, their medical encyclopedia because it doesn't mean anything to the patient. Right. And it's scary and... And showy. Just not helpful, yeah. right? So the same logic should apply here, that we would not go to our clients and spew out everything that we know in technical behavior analytic language because it's off-putting. It doesn't mean anything to them. And if our goal is to help our clients, then this is clearly not helpful. So Newman discusses subtle listener effects, meaning the way that we talk about behavior can have a pretty large effect on the audience that hears that language. And to quote him, he says, small variations in behavioral descriptors can produce dramatic effects on interpretation of behavior. And for an example, he said, if you say, I eat fruit versus I eat hamburgers, those two different statements, which are very small differences there, could have a very large effect on how people respond to that statement, even though it's just a small change, right? Similarly, if you were to say reinforcing people versus reinforcing behavior, that as well has very different valence to it for people outside of our field, right? And could really be interpreted in largely different ways. So he says we need to be aware of this and incorporate those types of subtle changes into our language when we're discussing it with an audience. And then he hits home on, I think, what is a really, really important point here, maybe the point of his article, which is, <laughs> he says, we can have verbal precision without using the technical language that we know. Yes. And Right? Oh, hitting it home, Newman. Right, exactly. So, the, like I said, this is a, an important distinction, right? We have our technical vocabulary, and that works really, really well within our verbal community. But it doesn't mean that when we go outside of that verbal community that we can't describe things in a way for people to take home a precise meaning of what we're saying if we just use the right terminology. And, and I'm not meaning our technical terminology. I'm meaning we need to find ways to describe what we're talking about with precision such that everyone in our listener bubble can come away with the same thing and respond to us in the same way. He gives an example about a donkey, which is a little bit long, but the, <laughs> but the takeaway from it is sometimes we use the words mistake and accident interchangeably, but depending on the circumstances surrounding whether we say it was a mistake versus it was an accident can actually be quite different, right? So neither of those are a technical term, but they have a really precise meaning. And we need to hone in on what those precise meanings are when we're giving descriptions of our technical language for the, a lay person. You go and you're going to shoot your donkey and you go and you accidentally it's dark and you take the wrong donkey and you shoot it. That's a mistake. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to shoot your donkey and then the other donkey sort of wanders into your sight and you shoot it, that's an accident. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. It was a rather violent example. I really like, wish you'd picked a different one. <laughs> perhaps you could have chosen. I mean, like, let's think about what we're what we're talking about mm -hmm. here. Right, guys? Yep, that was the example. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Within the section, he also discusses what, what are called category mistakes. And he says that students of behavior analysis, this could happen to them as well as when we're attempting to explain our science outside of our field. And he calls the category mistakes attributing things or events. This is a quote as well to the same grouping when they are distinct or drawing distinctions when there are no distinctions. So his example here again was saying reinforcing people versus reinforcing behavior, right? Except here what he's referring to is there should be a distinction between those two things, right? And one of them is using our science in a correct way. And then one of them is overgeneralizing basically what it means to reinforce. So if we are carefully applying this use of precise language, then we're identifying category mistakes for our listeners and helping to correct those, not needing to use technical language, but just by furthering the discrimination. That's what he's talking about here, right? They're, the terms have not been properly discriminated within the language. And then the real take-home point of all of this is that language doesn't need to be technical, but it does need to be precise with regard to how the behavior and the inter environment interact without referencing explanatory fictions or mediating constructs when we're providing these precise but non-technical descriptions. And that should be something that we can do. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about that in our dissemination station. This is the section of the show where we, where we take what we have learned and we sort of talk about some practical guidance going forward. And I think this is definitely a topic that is in need of a lot more steps. You know, we don't know to the extent to which our terminology affects other behavior. You know, we, we have a sense of what that could be, but that doesn't mean we, you know, it's, it's an exhaustive exploration of, you know, just looking at unpleasant un and pleasant and motivating, not motivating. That's, that's not everything in terms of how the listener responds to speaker behavior. We also don't know the, I think what we all would like to hear faster, which is well, what would the best terms to use that are both precise, use no jargon, and then also are considered pleasant or motivating or both. We just don't have that information. So what do you think? So in terms of what could you do tomorrow as a practitioner, if you're listening to this on you know a Monday or Tuesday or whatnot, what could you as a practitioner do to sort of improve the standing of behavior analysis in relation to the use of our jargon? What I really like doing is using both, right? Mm -hmm. So using precise language, but then describing it. Yep. So that I can use the precise language, but then I can make sure that I'm saying it in words that people understand. Mm -hmm. So that's what I like to do. Mm -hmm. See, I like to do the opposite. I like to do it as like in a positive. You know, what we're going to be doing is, you know, providing something really preferred to increase the chance behavior occurs. You know, reinforcement. I don't know if that's better. My thought's always been like, if I say it like that, then people, the listener will go, oh, I've heard of that. Like, it'll sure. attract them to the term, but maybe dodge some of the unpleasant or <laughs> unmotivating components of the language. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, I do it the way you do, Rob. And I also think maybe that it hopefully prevents it from sounding like I'm like they're in school with me, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, today we're going to do positive reinforcement. And that is yep. blah, 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 right? Well, I guess I'm the teacher. No, I don't know. I'm but just you know I do you, it, right? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, who it's knows? True. The they, way you present the information, everyone might love that and hate the way we do it or vice versa. It's true. So, you know, I used to work with families that didn't have any background in behavior analysis, and I was the first person they met. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was part of my job was to try to explain to them in really simple, friendly terms, hopefully, like what exactly these things were they were going to be doing. And that was part of like my initial rollout. I was like, and then we're going to practice the skills a whole lot and we're going to provide help to do them if needed. And then as soon as that, as soon as we provide the help, we're going to follow it up with something that your child really, really likes. Right. And that's going to help that behavior to occur more often with less help. Mm -hmm. Like within that example, I fit in like components of discrete trial training, components of prompting and components of reinforcement. Yeah. All of it right there. Even going beyond your examples of precision, Diana, and then the, the, the examples of precision that Newman brings up. Mm -hmm. I think we also haven't talked about and it's not really mentioned in any of these articles, the idea of, say, metaphor or example yeah. as uh, verbal behavior, which might improve which might be more you know preferred listener behavior i think you know if you ever listen to pat fryman talk 
he likes to bring up the idea of what we're doing as a story. You know, people love to hear a story. So can you tell a story about the principle of reinforcement or a story about the principle right. of extinction? Yes. You know, I mean, how, how many and times? And Hanley does that too. Uh, yep. How, how many times have you talked about ex- the idea of extinction and brought up the example of, it's like when you put a dollar in the vending machine and then the d- it doesn't take it. You know, what do you do? And everyone goes, well, I put the dollar back in. Of course. Then what would you do? Well, I probably start kicking the machine and get really mad because it's not. Yeah, that's your extinction burst. And everyone goes, oh, and they all laugh. Now, I have never done anything experimentally with that to say. And then everyone understood the concept of extinction burst or was able to better respond to an extinction burst. No clue. But, you know, at least what I can observe is more of what I would hope is a pleasant response to my verbal behavior in describing a relatively technical term. But in that instance, the hitting would actually be extinction-induced responding, wouldn't it? Because the extinction burst would be an intensity of the actual behavior. So, like, it would be, like, throwing the coins in and then keep throwing the coins in, like, with more intensity. Kicking it would be actually extinction-induced. You mean emotional response? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not an extinction burst there, but... Am I being precise enough for what my goal is? Right, so, yeah. Right. But who knows? And no... Right. But again, I have no idea if that matters at all because I have no idea if I have done anything to actually change behavior or increase acceptance of the treatment I am now, <laughs> I am now prescribing. Right. I have no idea. I'm just sort of saying things and they seem better. You know, people don't run away when I'm using examples like that. So I have to assume that there's something, you know, worth exploring there, but I don't know what. Yeah. And you're kind of talking about two different things too, which is, are we looking to increase others' understanding of our science or just their acceptance of our science or both? Mm -hmm. Both most of the time. But who knows? Depends on my audience. Am I talking to my new students who I want to stay in my graduate program or am I talking to a family who I think would benefit from ABA services? Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard hard balance, right? Or just your, you know, your party friend. (laughs) Yeah. So they're just trying to keep them. (laughs) I'm just trying to make everyone leave me alone at a party. So, you know (laughs) what? Just trying to have the cheese platter all to yourself. Yep. <laughs> the edamame bowl. Yeah. Yeah. One idea that I had that, I don't know, I hope doesn't come off as too crass, but at the bare minimum, maybe we just need to do like a marketing study and just really look at different ways to describe some of the common treatments that get prescribed and then just do that the social validity check of which of these do you prefer and then just do it with different audiences teachers in schools that might have uh, a BCBA consulting with them, parents who might be hiring a BCBA to help with home support, new graduate students, older graduate students, other experts in the field, and really just get a sense of where do each of these different terms fall on that spectrum of pleasant to unpleasant, motivating to unmotivating, you know, what, what other emotional respondings, acceptable to not acceptable might even be what we want to look at. You know, if I told you I want to do a treatment using extinction, what's your gut reaction to my treatment? Just listening to the word. Yeah. Is it good? Is it bad? It's bad. Yeah. I mean, I, I would guess it's going to be bad considering it was bad just in terms of people's you know, gut reaction right. to the emotionality of the word. But in terms of acceptability, you know, do, could we look at that more closely? And then the other piece of knowing that wouldn't necessarily tell us what we want to know, which again is, are we conveying the information that we want to convey? Are we increasing understanding of behavior? Are we increasing acceptability of our treatment? Because you can, only, you can go so far in the other direction too of like, I'm not going to use extinction. I'm going to use, you know, flowery flower floss, the kind parenting, the tough love approach. Just, you know, yeah, mm-hmm. you, you can make up terms that don't mean anything anymore. I'm wondering if we maybe look at a similar field, a similar but different field of ours that has experienced this problem, right? Because I'm pretty sure we're not the only ones in the world that have started a profession. We're relatively new in a profession and people don't like our language mm-hmm. and look at a field that's successfully gone through that to see what they've done, right? I'm pretty sure that the field of medicine has had some ups and downs in their time, Mm -hmm. you know, and and I'm also wondering if just our reputation as it gets better and there's more results and more success stories that are, you know, disseminated, will that help? Yeah. Right? I mean, we're only now just getting kind of the second stage. We're not main stage yet. We're like the opener to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But if we can, like, promote ourselves within what we're doing outside what we're doing, expand our services to beyond this niche that we've created for ourselves, will we then see more acceptability? You know, there'll be more, what's it called? More visibility. Yes. 
Thanks. Then maybe we would be a headliner. Yeah. If I wrote a book on behavior analysis called like giving people what they want and need. Oh, that sounds great. As opposed to like, you know, using the principles of reinforcement to increase the probability of behavior occurrence. Like, oh, no, I don't want that. What <laughs> treatment a terrible is that? Title. That treatment's terrible. That, that actually could be your parenthesis. <laughs> your colon. <laughs> right? Yeah. Colon. Blah, 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 blah. So I don't know. I, I guess to folks out there, if you're interested in researching this topic, go right ahead. I think these are four really exciting articles to read. I think the Newman specifically really takes a very complex discussion and really breaks it down in behavior analytic terms that are, feel very readable, but also very, just very intelligent in the description. Talk about precise. And the other articles, I think, point to some key components that we need to be aware of. I almost just want to start keeping a log of like how I describe things to people and then ask them, they're like, what did you think when I told you about that? And just start getting a sense of, you know, people I see on the street or people I work with. Like, oh, did you like that term? What do you think of that term I used? Yeah, you should. And just kind of just keep information that way. I keep seeing, I see most of the same people on a regular basis. <laughs> so they might get tired of that question. <laughs> I'll describe it differently. <laughs> same yeah. treatment, describe it two ways. And although I think the research is certainly important here, you know, I kind of wonder if rather than going like big level market research is that we take this to the individual mm -hmm. level sooner rather than later, mm -hmm. right? So we have enough information here to see that just using behavior analytic language on its own is really not preferred. Yeah, don't do that if you're talking to someone who is not an expert in the field of behavior analysis. Right. We don't need more of that to know anything further than we should be adding on at the very least, right? Mm -hmm. We should either be leading with an alternate explanation of what these terms mean or following up with an alternate explanation of what these terms mean and trying to make our introduction of our science as friendly and consumable as possible for people who don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Like to me, like that's already clear. So if we can help people out there working with clients regularly in the field, like take that away from this conversation. And I think that that's the most important mm -hmm. point right now, even if there are further delineations that research could help to yeah. illuminate. And just if you're, if you're using terms and you're not sure, am I going too far in the direction of imprecise for the purpose of being warm and fuzzy? Take a moment, describe something, you know, to your, to your phone, record it, play it back to another colleague and say, does this sound like what I think it should sound like? Does this still describe this principle. Get some social validity feedback that way. You know, if you give it to a couple other, you know, colleagues who are, who are behavior analysts and they say, no, that's not at all what you're talking about. Okay, well then what's wrong about it? How could you modify it so that you keep the gist of what you're trying to say, the warm and fuzziness of it, I guess, but improve the precision? Because, you know, we don't, like Newman stated, it's not, they're not mutually exclusive goals. It's not like we have to come up with some sort of warm and fuzzy marketing term or be precise in our use of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. There's another Newman, not this Newman, but a different Newman mm -hmm. <laughs> that also wrote a book mm -hmm. that breaks down behavior analytic terms into really friendly language. It's like a glossary. Cool. And that might be something that, that folks could check out, whether they're students or whether they would be looking for ways to, to assist themselves in doing this for families. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I guess that brings us to the end of our episode on behavior mm -hmm. analytic language. Sad. And acceptability thereof. I'm unhappy and unmotivated <laughs> <laughs> to be done. That sounds like a threat. Ah! Auto. Well, that's yes. <laughs> Thanks for bringing us back to the center. Speaking of random words, it's time for that second secret code word. And it is heart. I bet that is mildly motivating as well as highly pleasant. Heart. H-E-A-R-T. Unless you're talking about the band Heart or Barracuda, their hit single, in which case that's both highly motivating and highly pleasant. Or Ooh. eating. Barracuda. <laughs> Eating a heart? Well, now we're going to unpleasant and not motivating. <laughs> anyway. No, it is motivating unpleasant. Oh, because, you're yeah, it's motivatingly yeah. unpleasant. Heart. All right, everybody. I guess that brings us to the end of another fun-filled episode of ABA Inside Track. I want to thank both you and... Both you, I love both you and both you. you and you, you and both you. Jackie and Diana, because you don't know who I'm looking at out there. Thank you both for being here and discussing these fun articles with all of our listeners. 
Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And you. And we certainly want to, of course, say thank you to everyone who has been listening to ABA Inside Track into the new year. If you liked the show, please think about subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please, please leave us a review if you like with some feedback. There's some other ways you can do that, too. You can reach out to us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest as ABA Inside Track. You can go to the website, abainsidetrack.com, where you can leave comments or get links to the articles that we discussed. You can also find all of these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature enabled. And of course, if you just want to reach out with some topic ideas or some thoughts of your own, please do so at our email address, abainsidetrack at gmail.com. And of course, we couldn't do the show without a big thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for our opening and closing song. For Kyle Sturry, for our middle song. And of course, these episodes have been edited by Dan Thibet of Liquid Studios. We'll be back next week with another full length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. Bye.